So glad for all that's tuned in at this time as we continue in our Bible study. We've been studying the last few weeks from the book of Ephesians, and we want to continue in that uh, study, with Ephesians chapter 6 specifically. And we're going to spend some time here in a study from Ephesians chapter 6, especially verses 10 through 18. So if you want to, you can get your Bible out now. Uh, follow along with the things we're going to study. Uh, as we spend time in the book of God, feel free to take any notes that you'd like to take. And of course, if you'd like to ask your Bible questions, ask something related to Ephesians chapter 6 or any other Bible-related uh, questions, as far as that's concerned, uh, certainly you can get a hold of me. Uh, you see here the the uh, web address right here, uh, caneybillchurchofchrist.com. And you can go there, and there's access to email and things like that. You can uh, contact me that way if you'd like. Uh, you can go to Facebook also, CaneyvilleChurchOfChrist.com. Look us up on Facebook, uh, Caneyville Church of Christ, I should say. And uh, then you can send messages that way, uh, ask questions and what have you. But like I said, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, and about verse 10 down through verse number 18. We're going to spend our time uh, there in this particular study. But before we do, as we always uh, do, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. And so let's pause and, and have a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this day. We're so thankful for all the blessings you give to us day by day. So thankful for the fact that you've allowed us this time that we can open up God's word, we can study, we can take the things that we have learned and use them and apply them in our, in our lives. As we uh, look into the book of Ephesians chapter 6, we ask that you please help us, that we will take the things that we uh, learn, that we will see how they applied certainly in the first century, but then also make applications to ourselves today. We might be the kind of people that you'd have us to be. So thankful for thy book, so thankful for the truth, so thankful for Jesus and his great sacrifice, and so thankful we have this time together. So all these things we ask in the name of thy son, Jesus. Now, when you look in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, uh, it, it'd be good for us to go over there and, and to read that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll begin reading verse number 10. He says, Finally, brethren, this is the apostle Paul writing, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He said, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, uh, he says, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on a breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall quench, be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So here in this section, uh, we find the Apostle Paul, once again, I'll go back to verse number 10 as we be, we're going to start that study. But when you look there, you see him saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Uh, there is something we need to remember about being, being with the Lord or being strong in the Lord, and that is that that's where our strength comes from. The, uh, well, Paul would tell the Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, uh, there that I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, see, who strengthens. He gives me the strength. And notice here what he's told the Ephesians. Similar thing. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And it's interesting, that phrase in the Lord was the same phrase we saw in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, there in verse 1, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And we saw that that meant by or according to the Lord's authority. Uh, again, sometimes people say, well, that means in the Lord means uh, a Christian, means somebody's a Christian. Well, that doesn't mean children obey your parents only if they're Christians. It's children obey your parents in the Lord by the authority of, of God, by the authority of the Lord. That's what it is. And it's the same thing here. 
in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, where he says, be strong in the Lord. That doesn't mean uh, only Christians are strong or only be strong if you're a Christian or some, something like that. He means be strong in or in, in connection with the Lord, in connection with the Lord's authority, in connection with who God is. Be strong in that and in the power of his might. I don't trust in in myself. I don't trust in my strength. I don't trust in my uh, you know, thoughts as such or or my experiences as saying that somehow my experiences are authoritative because I can do things wrong and I can have experience at doing things wrong and I can have a habit of doing things wrong a whole bunch of times. But that doesn't make it right just because I've done something wrong a bunch of times. Rather, uh, I need to be strong in the power of his might and trust in it because that's what it is that's going to save me, okay? And so we could go into more of that, and I'm sure we will here in a little bit. But where I want to do now, I want to jump over to our, to our chart and notice here what it says. I want to back up just for a moment and remind you, of course, about uh, how we need to act. Now, that's the first nine verses of, of Ephesians chapter 6, and I just want to look at it just for a moment. But remember, the first few verses of chapter 6 remind us of how children respond to parents and how uh, the parents need to respond to their children and so on and so forth. We also find here that how Christians must act with an employer and employee relationship. We talked about master and slave last time, and really that's in the passage, of course, is master and slave, but it has to do with the employer and employee in a modern uh, application of it, okay? And we can do that. We can make modern day applications, obviously, to what God has given us. And so it's kind of like employer employee situation, so far as that's concerned. That your uh, the employee is working for their employer, just like they would work for the Lord. And the employer, master, the employer, is one who treats his employees well, being mindful that he himself has somebody who is judging him, okay? And so with those things in mind, then he talks about how we ought to be, uh, we ought to remember that we're in a spiritual battle for our souls. And so from verse 10 to verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 6, talks about the things that a Christian needs to wear. Now, when we talk about what we're going to wear, it's not necessarily a discussion of modesty or immodesty of physical clothes. We could do that. We can have that discussion if you'd like. It's not really here. He's talking about, in this case, what you wear spiritually. So finally, my brethren, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Finally. In other words, I'm, I'm going to bring this letter to an end. I'm going to bring all my thoughts to an end. The things I've said from chapter 1 on, I'm going to bring it all together here at this last final section of chapter 6. So be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's something I need to remember. Uh, we often forget that we are in a battle for our for souls. You know what? And so, like I said, whenever we go back for a moment and just look at this verse, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, then he talks about put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You need to put on the whole armor of God. See, that's what Christians need to wear. You need to have not some of the armor or, or part of the armor or one piece and not another. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole thing. He said that is what's going to bless you. That's what's going to help you in this situation that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All right? And so wiles of the devil has to do with the idea of how he can trick you, how the devil is able to tempt you, how he's able to trick you, how he's able to lie to you, how he's able to deceive you. And he says, you need to make sure, and I need to make sure, that I can stand against those things and fight against that. And as these um, pieces of armor are further explained, you'll see how this works. But here he is talking about the wiles. Listen, this is the real thing. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You know what? We really don't. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not what happens. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. 
And you can see this in John 18, 36, for example, and other places. But Jesus would say there in John 18, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered unto the Jews. As he stood before Pilate at this point. John 18, 36, now is my kingdom not from hence. The King James says not from hence. Hence means here. Not from hence means not from here. It's not from the earth. This is not a, a, a kingdom that is uh, on the move from the standpoint of trying to conquer lands and property and nations and kingdoms and so forth. That's not what this is. Whenever Peter, you remember, pulled the sword out and he went and he uh, cut, uh, took a swing there at, at, at the servant Malchus, you remember, and said he cut his ear off. And then Jesus told him, put your sword back up. The, in this case, the fighting that's taking place is not uh, earthly fighting, if you will. It's not guns and bombs and swords. It's not those things. And we need to remember that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. People are one to the Lord by the mind, as it were, a battle of the mind, a battle of the wills, and so forth. It is not, the kingdom of God is not won or is not expanded at the point of a sword or at the muzzle of a gun. Okay? That's not the way the kingdom of God expands. It is done in a spiritual way. And so you look back in this. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Not in that way. We don't do that. We don't fight against one another and try to destroy kingdoms and such, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's been lamented that in America we forget that we're actually in a war. Uh, there's been a war uh, against terrorism, and it's been going on, uh, well, since 2002, 2003, when it really got ramped up. We've been in a fight, and, and, and I know the argument could be made we've been in a, in a war against terrorism since September 11th, uh, but from the official standpoint, uh, war was declared and so forth, and things happened about 2003 on forward. And it's just been going on and on and on. Well, and say, well, we tend to forget that we're in a war. Why do we forget that we're in a war? We forget that we're in a war because we don't see it necessarily. Um, the war takes place where? Well, it takes place in some other country. It takes place over in the Middle East somewhere. It takes place over here, over here, over here. And so we don't see it all the time on our shores. The biggest one, the biggest, obviously, was on September 11th, and it was brought to our shores. But since then, it's been pushed back. Now, I say that to say this. There's a spiritual war going on. There's a war for souls that's happening. And the problem is so many of us don't see it. The problem is so many of us are not paying attention. And we don't realize that the war that takes place, you've got a Christian, you have a child of God, you have somebody, just like these Ephesians, Acts chapter 19, and the first five verses talks about how they became Christians and were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. Whenever somebody hears God's word and believes it, repents of their sins, confesses Christ, and is baptized, they become a Christian. And from Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 19, we find folks becoming Christians and following that very same pattern, following that very same uh, teaching or doctrine. And he says, when you follow that pattern of teaching, Romans chapter 6 says, 17 and 18, you then become free from sin. And so having then made free from sin, now we're the servants of righteousness, and but we're also called soldiers. And more on that in a moment. But I want you to see this. He says, we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in the high places or the heavenly places, some versions say. There is a war going on. And when we forget, that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to forget that we're in a war. He wants us to forget that there's any kind of struggle. He wants us to forget that there's any kind of issue like that. He wants us to forget about that and be lazy and just kind of lay, lay back and, and don't worry about it, don't think about those things, and, and we don't even understand what's happening. 
But notice here, he says this war is going on and it is against the spiritual wickedness in the high places, in the heavenly places. And this is the reason then why you need to take upon you the whole armor of God. Okay? So let's go back to our, to our chart here. And we were looking at that a moment ago. But we, need, we often forget this. We need to understand there is a war for our souls going on. And I told you we would look at this. We're called soldiers in the scriptures no less than four times. In the book of Philippians 2.25 and 2 Timothy 2 and Philemon and verse 2, you're going to see the term, especially Philippians 2 and Philemon 2, you're actually going to see the term fellow soldiers. All right, so when you look up the word fellow soldiers and you see that, then Paul's saying, I'm a soldier with you. I'm a soldier right along with you. We are fellow soldiers in this war, okay? And you see it again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and he reminds Timothy, no man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath called him to be a soldier. No man that wars is going to entangle himself in those things. He says, you need to make sure that you're not entangled in the affairs of this world, but that you are uh, a soldier, but you are one who is focused on the goal and focused on the work that is ahead of you. That's the point. And so we are called soldiers, you know, and we're called that just like Christians are called to, to be in the family of God and the household of God and, and sheep in the sheepfold and, and all these wonderful descriptions that, that deserve our attention and deserve our respect, but we're also called soldiers. Soldiers in the army. And Jesus is called the captain of our salvation, Hebrews chapter 2. Don't ever forget about that. It is Jesus. In fact, it's in this very uh, book where we've already uh, studied earlier on how that Jesus led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. You read about ca leading captivity captive. That's military imagery. See, that is a military. That's something where they had a war they had had this uh, you know armed conflict. Jesus came out the winner and led captivity captive. Same idea, same idea here with our fellow soldiers. You know, well, look in Ephesians six verse eleven and twelve, and we already we already read this a moment ago. But but notice what kind of war are we in? I think we've made that clear by now, haven't we? What kind of war is this? I'll give you a moment to think about. It. What kind of war is this? Well, of course, we know this is war is a spiritual war. It's a spiritual battle we're in. And who or what are we fighting? Again, that's found uh, in the text, isn't it? That's found right there in the text. Who or what are we fighting? Well, he says we are fighting against what? Against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness, he says, in the heavenly or high places. That's what we're doing. See, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. That's not what we're fighting. But we're fighting, again, that spiritual war, that spiritual conflict. So don't ever forget about that. Whenever someone becomes a child of God, whenever somebody, as I just described, they follow the Lord's plan of salvation, as we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36 to 38, whenever you hear and believe and repent, you confess and you're baptized, you rise to walk in newness of life. Your sins are forgiven. You are welcomed into the family of God. God adds you to his church, Acts 2, verse 47. You have your sins forgiven, like I already said, Acts 2, 38. You uh, are, well, receive all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And the other thing is you are issued a weapon because you're a soldier. It is not time to go lay down in the hammock and just wait for Jesus to show up. It is time to get to work, to be busy, because you have to save your soul and help save the souls of others. What are we supposed to be wearing? Well, we need to be wearing the armor that God has provided. You know, that's something that we don't always appreciate, but it's, it is true. God has given us armor to wear. Paul would tell Timothy, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, Paul would tell Timothy in that passage to fight the good fight of faith. 
and lay hold on eternal life. Yes, fight the good fight of faith. You need to do that, and I need to do it. Because that's part of our work, part of our responsibilities. And so what do we have? Well, there's pieces of armor that we find uh, there. And it's interesting. I put Isaiah 59 on there for a reason. It's interesting because Isaiah 59 and verse number 17 describes for us actually armor that God was wearing. And uh, it, like I said, you can you can go back. We're not, not going to be able to go to the entire context of Isaiah 59 and lay this out like I'd like to. But Isaiah 59 and verse number 17, and uh, notice here what it says. In 59 and verse number 17, it says, For he, now, now in this case, the he of 59, 17, the he is God. And again, you'll see that in the context. You read all that chapter. He, God, put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now, here, just touching on a couple things. He put on what? Talks about the breastplate, as uh, righteousness as a breastplate. A little later, we're going to read about the breastplate of righteousness. Is there much difference in those things? The helmet of salvation upon his head. Hmm. Seemed like I read that somewhere, too. See, what Paul was describing for us and what Paul was making clear is that is the connection with the spiritual armor even of God. And so what, what it amounts to is God, uh, in a spiritual sense, God is dressing us like him. Think about that. We're putting on the armor. Well, God's had the armor on, and now he wants us to have the armor on too as we're supposed to be his soldiers. See that? Now, that's the truth. Sometimes you ha hear people say, well, you know, Paul was sitting in a prison and, and he was sitting here and he happened to look over and see this soldier standing over there guarding him and he saw he had a helmet on and, and you know, and, and had a sword and shoes. That, and he's like, well, you know, that'd be a good, that, that, that describes, and as if this was some type of, a, of an epiphany that Paul had, not appreciating the fact that the words Paul wrote were inspired of God in the first place. They're inspired of God. It wasn't that Paul just sat there and had an epiphany one day and thought, well, I just think I'd talk about armor now. Connected with Isaiah, folks. And not only in this passage, but we can go through Isaiah and see how God had these, these pieces of armor. And now Paul just takes them and, and puts them together and applies them to a Christian. It's a beautiful thing. And so what do you have? He said you need to put on, verse 14, that belt. Loins girt about with truth. Some versions will say the belt of truth. See, the belt is necessary, isn't it? And this is just going in order in the, in the verses. He said, once you put on breastplate of righteousness, we talked about that, didn't we? What else do we find? Well, he says, there's shoes to wear. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So your feet have the have or shod. That's talking about shoes you got on, shoes to help you move and help you run and so forth. And more on that in a moment. But he says in the preparation of the gospel of peace. What else was worn? You got your Bible out. You following along? What else? We had now we had the belt. We had talk about breastplate righteousness, shoes, feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. What comes next? That's right. Shield of faith, he says. You need a shield of faith so as to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In other words, when the fiery darts, when the flaming arrows are shot and psh, they come your way, then you can hold up the shield and you take that shield and hold it up as protection and the, and the arrow psh, hits the shield and it doesn't hit you. And so there's your protection. Shield of what? Of faith. Hmm. This is getting interesting. Next. He said you're supposed to be wearing the helmet of salvation. How about that? Helmet of salvation. We read that. That's something that God was wearing too, wasn't it? 
And what's the next thing? That's right. Sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit, Paul describes as what? Sword of the Spirit is what? See, verse 17. It's the Word of God. And then something else he talks about is prayer. And I don't know if that gets as much attention as it needs to get, but we're going to give it attention. Prayer is needed. All things, he says, you remember putting all these things on with prayer? And verse number uh, verse number 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So yes, we see that need, don't we? We see the importance of having what? Prayer, he says, uh, at, the, at that time. Well, let's get a little more in, into this then. Talking about the pieces of armor again. And notice, we're, I'm going to get more specific with these pieces and see some applications that we can make with them here uh, in the next little bit. First of all, notice, he says, you got the belt of truth. The belt. He says uh, here that your loins girt about with truth, the belt of truth. The belt is what's holding all this together. And I find it interesting, a lot of times when I've described the, the armor, a lot of times I'll start with the helmet of salvation and just da -da 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 go from the head to the foot, pretty much. He doesn't start there. Verse 14, he talks about the belt first. And perhaps there's significance to that, but I just think here's that belt holding everything together. That's what's holding on the breastplate. That's what's holding on all the things that's, that's guarding your internal organs and such. And you got that belt around there holding everything together. That's what it's doing. You find something else, though. Just going in order again. What was the next thing? Remember the next thing? That's right. Breastplate of righteousness. Now, breastplate of righteousness, of course, is, is covering and, and is protecting the heart and protecting the lungs or, or other vital organs, obviously. Trying to protect you from the sword swipes and the spears and whatever else you can have. And you can ha have that protection. Now, I don't know if you've heard this before, but I know for a long time people would say, well, you know, there's no armor for your back because God doesn't want you running away. I beg to differ. Not that God wants you running away, but I beg to differ on that first part. See, people who know about this stuff said the breastplate is deceiving. That, that word is deceiving because what it actually was was something that covered the front and it covered the back. And so you had, you had this piece of armor that would cover your organs from the front side and cover them from the back side, and no doubt that belt hooked it all together so it held up and close to your body if you are wearing a literal, literal armor. And so here these things were, front and back, holding on, making sure you're protected, and the belt of truth around that, and you've got that. So there was armor for the back, see? And like I said, that name's a little deceiving because you think breastplate, but it's not. It's the whole thing. It's the whole body plate. It's covering the thorax, if you will. It's covering the abdomen. It's covering all this area here that you've got, front and back. He says, I want you to wear that. And like I said, that's something God was wearing, like we read in Isaiah 59. And that's something we need to wear too. We need to have that on. And a Christian uh, who doesn't have that, see, is going to be in heap big trouble because you're just a big target. I'll tell you something else. You remember he said, I want you to wear the shoes, feet shod with the what? preparation of the gospel of peace with the preparation anytime you read about feet you usually read about some, it's indicative of motion or action in other words that's the application you can make of it anytime you read in the bible about somebody's feet or you read about somebody walking uh, you know walk in love like we read from ephesians chapter 5 and you walk in love and you walk in the light and all those things and even 1 John 1, walk in the light as he is in the light, and so on and so forth. When you see that imagery of walking, of those types of things, it's indicative of action, of motion. Okay, 
So he says, here's the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he says, you got your shoes on for that. What does that mean? It means it's indicative of action. It means I need to be spreading God's word. I need to be telling it. I need to be talking about it. Listen, that's what, that's what uh, you know, gets you in some of the trouble you get into sometimes is because we start talking about Jesus and we start telling folks about what about the Lord's power and about what the Lord has said and, and all, all that and the plan of salvation and then there's people who just don't want to hear it and the battle is on. Now, I wish that wasn't that way and I wish people could, you know, be kind and all that, but it doesn't always happen that way. You got your feet shot. You're ready. You're in, it's indicative of action, motion. You got to be moving. We've got to be uh, acting. We have to make sure that we are doing and acting in a way that pleases God and that spreads his word, you know? And that's been something that's discussed all through the scriptures is how to spread God's word and to tell it to others and so forth. And so my feet need to be shod. My feet need to be ready to move. What else? We're going from Ephesians 6, verse 14, verse 15. What else was on the list? You remember? Feet shot with preparation of the gospel of peace. What else? Yep. Shield of faith. The shield of faith, he says, will protect you from the fiery darts, protect you from the arrows, as it were, the flaming arrows, the onslaught of Satan as he tries to hurt you, as he tries to tempt you, as he tries to get you to give up and quit, as he tries to get you to go back into his kingdom. Now, you left his kingdom and went into the kingdom of Christ, Colossians 1, verse 14, and now he's trying to get you back. So with the flaming arrows and with those things, he's trying to hurt you and get you back. And you take that shield of faith. You remember? Take that shield of faith that's there and then to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, to fight those off. My friends, faith is it. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That is the truth. Read First John. You find here faith is so necessary. For without faith, Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I need to remember now how important faith really is. And that shield of faith, there's your protection. That's the true protection right there. Let's never forget that. Never forget it. Something else? What was the next thing on the list? Remember what was next? Yes, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. What is the what is the helmet good for? Well, helmet's good to protect your head, isn't it? You know? And uh, that's why folks you know, wear helmets when they're, uh, you know, flying the... You know, the, in the Air Force, those guys in the Air Force, and they're flying the F-16s, and they're flying all these fantastic airplanes and things, they've got a helmet on, don't they? Uh, so many times, so many states uh, have helmet laws for riding a motorcycle. And so, uh, you know, have helmets for that. Uh, have helmets in other situations. Race car drivers, they'll have helmets on too, won't they? I wonder why they're doing all that. They want to protect their head, don't they? The helmet of salvation. See? And I put on this chart here to protect my thoughts, my decision-making. That helmet blesses me in that way and to help me with my decision-making, with my thoughts, with the things that I do and the things that I'm deciding to do because whatever I say, whatever I do is a result of my thoughts. You know what? If you think about something long enough, you're going to do it. If you think about something long enough, you're going to say it. So that's how serious it is. I've got to watch that helmet of salvation. i tell you something else. He says, I want you to carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, sword, that's why I put on here, a sword is an offensive weapon. The shield is defense, all right? The sword is offense, see? Now, we need to remember that. The sword of the Spirit, listen to me, a sword is an offensive weapon, which means you go on the attack with it. We're not always used to that. We want to stand back, and, and so many times Christians want to stand back and say, well, just bring the fight to me. 
And, you know, I'll defend myself. I'll, but very rarely do you ever find folks willing to take the fight to somebody. But that's what the sword of the Spirit is about. Listen to me. A sword is not for picking your teeth with. You know what? A sword is not for cleaning your fingernails. It's not why you have a sword. You know what? A sword's not for scratching the mud out of your boots. A sword is an offensive weapon. A sword takes the fight to the enemy. And that's what he says to do. You need to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You need to, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. That's what it's about. I need to remember that. And all of these things covered with prayer. Somebody says, I can't hardly see all your points now you made. You got that one? Oh, exactly. Prayer covers the whole thing. Prayer covers it all. See, Ephesians 6 and verse 18. Prayer covers it all. That's the point. Because too many times, again, prayer is often omitted and it shouldn't be prayer is very much an important and a necessary weapon in our arsenal you know what and i need to remember that it is a vital part of our arsenal to pray to the god of heaven yes my friends do it now what ought we wear well what similarities do these pieces of armor have you think about that what similarities do they have well, did you notice that every piece, every piece of armor, go back for a moment, oops, go back for a moment. Every piece of armor here we can talk about that's supposed to be uh, upon us, as it were, spiritually, every piece is connected with the Word of God. The belt of what? Truth. John seventeen seventeen. thy word is truth. Breastplate of what? Righteousness. Uh, all thy commandments, the Bible says, are righteousness. It says in Psalm 119 and verse 160, uh, Romans 1 and verse 16 talks about that as well. Be shot of the preparation of the what? Gospel of peace. Uh, shield of faith. Where's your faith come from? Faith comes through hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Helmet of what? Helmet of salvation. Think about that. Helmet of salvation. How are we saved? We're saved when we hear, believe, and obey the Word of God. You know what? That's when it happens. Um, well, he says, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know what? All these things covered with our prayers. And so here, you see the connection real easy, don't we? The connection is every one of these things is connected with the gospel, connected with God's Word. And how necessary and needed it is that we know what God says and that we know it, that we believe it, and that we obey it. That it might cover us like a garment. Cover us like that precious armor that is so necessary. How do they help us in fighting temptation? Think about that. How do they help us in fighting? I think you know the answer. Don't you? All those things help us to fight temptation because I'm fighting off Satan at every corner whenever I do and whenever I follow what the Lord has revealed. How do they help us go to heaven? You can spend time thinking about these as well. How do these help us go to heaven? Well, think about it. God, the gospel is my roadmap to heaven. If I want to go from earth to heaven, I've got to do what the Lord says. I've got to follow his plan to get there. And all of that, again, covers me like a garment, doesn't it? And so we've already asked that question and answered it. But think about uh, how this all works together, friend. This is an amazing, amazing thing that we have before us. When we think about wearing the whole armor of God, we're talking about doing something serious, aren't we? And it says to fight against the spiritual wickedness in the high places or the heavenly places. That's something. That, that, that is not for, for the lazy. And that is not for somebody who thinks that being a Christian is just something where you go and then your your ticket's punched at the end of the day or whatever. You know what? It's not it's not that at all. It is a a time of of preparation for heaven. It is a time for being in the Lord's army. It is a time for being his soldier, of being one who serves and follows him with all your heart. Are you following the Lord with all your heart? 
Do you wear the full armor of God, the whole armor of God that's going to help you stand and withstand the devil? Because see, the point in all that is if you don't have those things, you will not be able to stand. You're going to fall. Don't fall down, my friends. But withstand and stand. And you do that through, by and through the gospel, through his armor. So if you don't have it, I hope that you'll contact me. We'll talk about God's word and we'll talk about what's necessary to be saved. You can be saved. You know, we'll baptize you into Christ. You can be a saved person. Somebody who has fallen away and turned away from God. You know, you can return to him as well. We'd love to help you. We'd love to encourage you in all these things. Please take advantage of it. Don't put it off anymore. You know what? So thankful that you tuned in, and I hope that this study has been helpful to you, has been encouraging to you, and I want to pause and have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we will be done. Okay? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this time of study. So thankful that we can spend time in God's book. We can learn from thee. We can learn what it is to have the whole armor of God. And Lord, pray that, that those that are watching will take the things that are, are said here and that we will, uh, will wear the whole armor of God. And I will not just uh, use one piece or another, but the whole thing, realizing that it's all connected through thy word. Please help us that we can spend more time in thy word. Please help us that we can live for thee and we can, can uh, do thy will and take the fight to the enemy that we might spread the borders of thy kingdom and be what you would have us to be. So thankful for thy blessings, so thankful for thy truth, so thankful for thy love. And so thankful that one day we can have heaven when this life is over. And so thankful for Jesus as well that makes all of these things possible through his sacrifice and through his love and through his blood. And it's through his name that we pray this prayer as well. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you again for tuning in. Thank you for being here at this time and look forward to being with you again very soon.